Um, as we uh, prepare our hearts to hear the word of God, let's go before the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord to speak to us this evening. Father, we come before your throne of grace, Lord, and we thank you, Father, for this opportunity, Lord, of being in your presence, worshiping you, and studying your word together. Lord, I pray as I speak, Lord, help me to decrease, O God, and for you to increase. Speak through me, O God, your word. And Lord, I pray all who have come today will hear your voice speak to them. Challenge us, O God. Let your word, like a, a surgeon's knife, O God, cut deep. And Lord, bring change from the inside out, O God. Help us to be more and more like you, O God, as we sit and study your word and, and hear your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I just want to thank um, uh, God and I want to thank the leadership of this church for giving me this opportunity to come and share the word of God. Um, I'm very bad with keeping time, so if someone can give me a signal if I'm going over time, I'll be very happy. Um, yes, so today we are going to speak about the challenge to discipleship in the teachings of Jesus. I believe this is a series that you have been doing for the past so many weeks. And if I were to give a heading to the passage of scripture we heard today, it would be making the right choice. It is said that the average person makes something, between, uh, something about 3,500 choices or decisions every day. Now, personally, I think that's a bit of an exaggeration because that means every two seconds you will have to be making a decision. Nevertheless, we make hundreds and hundreds of choices every day. From the time we wake up, what time we are going to wake up, what we are going to do when we wake up. Are we going to freshen up? Are we going to study the word of God? Are we going to drink a cup of coffee? What we are going to wear, what we are going to eat, every moment we are making decisions. In fact, it is said that most of these decisions we make, a lot of them at least, have to do with the food that we are going to eat. And I know for myself it's definitely true. Because my wife would tell me that even before I finish breakfast, we are already planning lunch and dinner. But the point is this. Every decision we make, whether it be minor or innocuous or whatever you may think it is, eventually affects the life you live. Um, in fact, Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of Theodore Roosevelt, who was the 26th President of the United States, she said, one's philosophy is not best expressed in words, it is expressed in the choices one makes. In the long run, we shape our lives and we shape ourselves. What she's saying is that the choices we make or the decisions we make shape who we become. As we come to the end, not of the series, but of the Sermon of the Mount, I believe that you started in chapter 5, and now we've come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7. And as we come to the end of the teachings of Jesus, Jesus has been describing what a true disciple, a true follower of Jesus would look like. In fact, he's describing the values that you and I as disciples of Jesus should embrace. In fact, he's laying down some principles that shattered the paradigm of the religious teachings of that time and began to teach a radical way to love, to love God and to love one another. We studied Jesus saying that we need to love our enemies, to do good to those who persecute us, if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to him the other. 
If someone compels you to go one mile, go two. Don't hate, don't lust. A radical way of loving and living. And probably, this is probably one of the greatest sermons ever preached. But we've come to the kind of the end of it, the last couple of verses. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, what do we do with this sermon? And this is what Jesus is getting to. For that matter, what do we do with any sermon? What do we do with any Bible study that we go to? What do we do with the devotion time we have in the morning, the reading of the scriptures? What are we going to do with those is the question. And what Jesus is about to show us is that you and I are going to make one of two choices. You and I are going to decide either consciously or unconsciously, either intentionally or unintentionally, we are going to choose one of two pathways to go. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, from Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 to 29, Jesus breaks it down into four or five categories. Four or five categories that follow two separate pathways. And the first one is he speaks about two gates, the narrow gate and the wide gate. He speaks about two parts, a difficult part and a broad part. He speaks about two trees, a good tree that brings forth good fruit and a bad tree that brings forth bad fruit. He talks about two kinds of people. Both profess Jesus to be Lord, but one does the will of the Father, while the other does not do the will of the Father. And this passage ends with Jesus talking about two kinds of foundations to build upon and two kinds of builders. A foundation built on the rock by a wise man and a foundation built on the sand by a foolish man. After hearing the words of the Sermon on the Mount, what decision, which part are you and I going to take? Which choice are we going to take? Now you might look at this and say, well, I'm not in a mood right now to decide. I don't think I need to make that decision right now. I'm not going to go through the narrow gate, neither am I going to go through the broad, wide gate. I'm not ready to make a choice. I'm not ready to make a decision. Well, even you not choosing is you have already made a choice. So as I said, intentionally or unintentionally, we are going to make a choice. So let's look at them more closely. The first one is the narrow gate. Jesus talks about a narrow gate. And the question is, what is this narrow gate? Why is this gate narrow? I believe the narrow gate refers to Jesus Christ himself. In John 10, verse 9, Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. <clears throat> In 1 Timothy 2, 5, Paul says, For there is one God and one, media uh, one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. These verses are telling us that this gate is narrow because it is only Jesus that can take you through this gate. John 14, 6 says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way to enter in. He is the gate. He is the only gate, only way. And the white gate I believe embodies everything else. All other religions, all other belief systems, all other philosophies, all those is the white gate. But in Luke 13 verse 24, Jesus says something that is quite concerning. In fact, 
and in reference to a narrow gate. In fact, this whole passage is very concerning. And when I started studying it, I began to realize and ask God, Lord, why me? Because it, there are some scary verses in this passage. In Luke 13, 24, it says, Strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Those are the words of Jesus. He says many will want to enter that narrow gate, but will not be able to enter that gate. And the question is, how come? Why can't people enter this gate even if they desire it? It is because to enter that gate, you have to lay down all your gods, all your idols, everything else to embrace Jesus Christ. And the problem, many would want it, but are unable to do it is because there are many people who are not willing to lay it all down. So let me give you an illustration. Hopefully this would help. There was a man who was uh, wanting to buy a gift for his wife. So he was doing some window shopping and he looked through this window. It was a jewelry shop and he looked and he saw the most wonderful, beautiful diamond ring. And he thought, this is a good gift for my wife, but I don't think I can afford it. But nevertheless, he went into the shop and he said, maybe I should, uh, you know, take a look. And he asked the jeweler if he can have a look at the ring. So the jeweler brought the ring out from the showcase and showed it to him. And as he looked at it, the jeweler saw in his eyes the desire for him to, to uh, have this ring. So the jeweler said, sir, do you want to buy the ring? And he said, well, I would like to, but I don't think I have enough money to purchase it. And the jeweler said, don't worry, sir. It only costs whatever you have. In other words, he says, it'll cost you all you have, that's all. So what do you have? So he looked in his wallet and he had 2,000 rupees. And he said, this is all I have. And the jeweler said, sir, I told you, it'll cost you all you have. So if 2,000 rupees is all you have, then here's the ring. Give me the 2,000 rupees. So the man gave the jeweler the 2,000 rupees and he was very happy. And he was probably one of those Pentecostal charismatic types. So he began to say hallelujah and praise the Lord right there in the jewelry shop. And he had a jacket. It opened up. And the jeweler saw something in his top pocket. It was his checkbook. And he said, sir, what's that in your pocket? And he said, it's my bank book. He said, oh, so you have a bank account. So I said, it'll cost you all you have. So the man said, well, well, what am I to do? I have about 20,000 rupees in the bank. He said, yes, sir, it'll cost you all you have. So he wrote a check for 20,000 rupees, yet he was getting a good deal. So he wrote the check and gave it to the man. And he said, thank you very much. And he was walking out the door. He put his hand in his pocket and he pulled out his car keys. And the jeweler said, excuse me, sir, what's that in your hand? And he said, it's my car keys. So I said, it'll cost you all that you have. Kindly hand over your car keys. And he said, if I give you my car, how do I go back home? He said, oh, sir, you have a home. I said, it'll cost you all you have. And then he said, if I give you my home, am I to sleep in a tent? And he said, oh, you have a tent, sir. It'll cost you all you have. And then he said, if I give you my tent, where would my children and my, fam my family sleep? And he said, oh, sir, you have a family. It will cost you all you have. The question before us today is that do you know that to walk through the narrow gate, it will cost you all you have. It will cost you your self-determination. It will cost you your selfish and self-ambition. It will cost you your self-will. It will cost you your sovereignty over your own life. 
It will cost you your own goodness and self-righteousness. It will cost you your dreams and desires. In fact, it will cost you everything you hold near and dear, including your own life. That's the cost of discipleship. That's the cost of being a Christian. In Luke 9.23, Jesus says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up the cross daily and follow me. We know the story of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, follow the commandments. And the man says, what commandments? Jesus lists out. Uh, you know, some of the Ten Commandments, actually the latter part of the Ten Commandments. And the man turns to Jesus and says, "From as I was a young child, I obeyed all these commandments. And then Jesus says, well, then this is what you must do. If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. In other words, he says, go sell all you have and come follow me. And the man said, I can't do that. And as he walked away, I think it's in the Gospel of Luke, it says Jesus was sad. But you don't find Jesus running behind him and saying, wait a minute, it's okay. You don't have to sell everything. Just give me whatever you like and keep the rest. In fact, the Bible says he allowed him to go. It will cost us everything we have to go through the narrow gate. In fact, in Luke 14, 33, Jesus, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he, all that he has cannot be my disciple. Friends, it is sad that often we think that being a Christian means as long as I'm committed to come to church on Sunday, as long as I'm committed to give, you know, an offering on Sunday, that's all the commitment I need to make to be a Christian. It is sad. I have spoken to many Christians and I've asked them about discipleship. And I've heard this, many Christians believe that you can be a Christian without being a disciple. In fact, they say that a Christian is someone who has believed in Jesus Christ and goes to church. A disciple is someone who is deeply committed to following Jesus. And let me tell you, there is no such categories, no such classes in the Bible. The book of Acts tells us the disciples were called Christians. In other words, if you are a Christian, you are a disciple. You cannot be a Christian without being a disciple. So the path, the gate is narrow, friends. And we need to understand what it takes to go through that gate. Secondly, he doesn't say only the gate is narrow. He says the path or the road is narrow. Not really narrow, he says it's difficult. The path is difficult. You know, as a, as a preacher sometimes, I need to repent and take responsibility. Because we don't preach a difficult path. In fact, we have taken the narrow road and we have taken some JCBs and steamrollers and leveled the ground and made it easy. Because we like to preach an easy gospel. We like to preach a very inclusive gospel which says, listen, you, just, you don't need to change. You don't need to give up anything. All you need to do is come to church and that's all it takes. And then go back and do whatever you please. And therefore, I don't know, 
Um, but we came up with this term called seeker-friendly churches. Churches where, you know, we kind of make, as long as you make the people happy and get more people to come, we are okay. But listen to this. Jesus said, this narrow path, only few will walk in it. We want to bring as many people into the church. And that's a good thing. I'm not, listen, please, please. As you write your comments, don't write, you know, he said it's a bad thing to have people in the church. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is this, the people who come to church need to understand what our commitment to Jesus Christ is. What it means to be a disciple of Jesus, what it means to be a Christian. It's a difficult path. We can't dilute the gospel, we can't dilute the word of God in fear of offending people. Jesus offended many people. One time he preached a sermon that was so offensive that over 6,000 men in the congregation, maybe there were more than that, women and children, decided to leave. And I think, when have I preached a, a message that was so offensive that one person left? No, I never preach that because I want people to stay. Make them comfortable. He was, the gospel is offensive. Because it says there's only one way to heaven, it's Jesus Christ. It is offensive. The path that leads to life is difficult. I mean, go back to the Sermon on the Mount and see what Jesus was speaking. He said, if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. Now let me ask you the question, how many of us want to do that? I don't want to do that. When I'm driving on the road, if a tricer driver cuts me off, I want to go and somehow get in front of him. You don't want to turn the other cheek. Love your enemies. Who here likes that? Lord, strike them first with lightning and I will love their ashes. We don't want to love our enemies. It's difficult. And to follow this road means every moment of the day making choices that your flesh, your desires, your carnal, carnal desires would scream, don't do it. You know, my sons, I used to come back some days from school or wherever they were and they used to come back and, and they used to say, Dada, why is it so difficult being a Christian? Taking the stands that we have to take. Sometimes we are ridiculed. Sometimes we are isolated. Sometimes people say bad things to us. They laugh at us. Why is it so difficult? And one of the things I have to always tell my boys is this, Jesus never called us to take the easy road. It is a difficult road because it's a countercultural road. It goes against everything you desire and want to do. Dying to self, humbling yourself, servant leadership, Going down so that he can lift you up. Dying so that you can live. The Broadway Christianity is very appealing to the flesh. But that's a false Christianity. And then, the good tree that bears good fruit and the bad tree that bears bad fruit. You know what's interesting about this portion of scripture, which starts in Matthew 15, uh, Matthew 7 verse 15, uh, uh, and ends in verse 20. It says, beware, it starts off with beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. You will know them by their fruit, that's what it says. Why would Jesus just add this little line in there? Because what he's saying is that even the bad trees on the surface look good. In other words, there are those people who may be sitting in church with you and 
taking the title of a Christian. They look like sheep, but they're not. The question is then, how do we know the fruit? And what is the fruit? You know, I've heard some people say the fruit is the number of people that you have in your church or your congregation. Others would say it's the, the signs and the wonders and the miracles that happen in your services. Now, all those things are good things. Once again, remember, I'm not saying they're bad. It's good to have people in the church. It's good to have God moving powerfully with signs and wonders and miracles. But I don't believe that's the fruit. In fact, we read, it says, broad is the way to destruction. And how many go in it? Many. Narrow is the way that leads to life. And how many are walking in it? Few. So it's definitely not numbers. Well, then is it signs, wonders, and miracles? Well, Matthew 7, 22, a few verses later, Jesus says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonders, miracles in your name? And what does Jesus say? I never knew you. So it's not signs, wonders, and miracles either. And you know, church, some people are mesmerized by these things. I've seen places where there are plenty of people but they are in doctrinal error, even bordering heresy. And if you ask some people who go there and say, why do you go there? If you're a Christian, why would you go to such a place? And they would say, well, there are people there. And if there are crowds, it must be good. Or there are signs, wonders, and miracles happening there. Once again, I'm not saying those things are bad, but those are not the fruit that Jesus is talking about. I believe the fruit is Christ-likeness. It is becoming more and more like Jesus. I believe it's the fruit of the Spirit that he's talking about. Because if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, it is about radically loving. And what are the fruit of the Spirit? The first one is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the fruit of the Spirit. And what Jesus is saying is when you walk down this path, when you choose the right gate and walk the difficult path, your fruit, these fruit are going to develop in your life where you will become more and more like Christ. It does not matter how long you've been in the church. It does not matter how much of the Bible you know. It does not even matter how many hours you spend on your knees. But ask yourself the question, are you becoming more like Jesus? If you go into your room and spend hours praying and, and fasting and praying and come back and treat your wife and children like rubbish, that's, there's something wrong with that spirituality. You can preach the word of God and then you go to your workplace and treat your people there with absolute arrogance. There's something wrong with your spirituality. The fruit you need to ask yourself is, are people seeing Jesus in my life? I remember I heard Selvin Hughes saying this once when he was doing a seminar on marriage. He said his wife was kind of slipping in and out of consciousness. It was kind of the last few days she was alive and he was by her side holding her hand. And he said some of the last words she spoke to him was this. She looked into his eyes and said, Selvin, I want to thank you because I saw Jesus in you. Ask yourself the question. Are the people working in your home, do they see Jesus in you? Does your husband or your wife see Jesus in you? Do your children see Jesus in you? Do your neighbors see Jesus in you? That's the fruit. Well, the next one, the fourth one, we are almost there. 
If I'm gone over time, please let me know. Okay. Uh, people who profess Jesus as Lord. No, the one before that, I think. Yeah? Okay, I think I made a mistake on this. Ah, there, that's one. They profess Jesus is Lord, but they don't do his will. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. I also want to show you something very interesting is that in this passage, Jesus is not speaking to unbelievers. He's speaking to believers. Who says, Lord, Lord? It's not an unbeliever who calls Jesus Christ Lord. It is someone who's supposed to believe in Jesus. And listen to what they say. I cast out demons in your name. A, a, a non-Christian is not going to cast out demons in the name of Jesus. He healed the sick in your name. He did miracles or wonders in your name. This is a Christian. He says, you're doing all these amazing things. You're serving God. You're doing these wonderful things. You even profess that I am Lord. But in reality, I am not your Lord because you don't do the will of the Father in heaven. In fact, Jesus turns to them and said, you are practicing lawlessness. He said, you who practice lawlessness. The word lawlessness here is anomia, the Greek word, which means no law. It's like living your life as if God never gave you commandments to live by. That's what it means. It means coming to church, doing all the Christian stuff, but once you leave these doors, you go out and live your life as if God never spoke to you about how you need to love your family and treat your family. It's almost like for the men that God never told us to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And for the ladies, it's like as if you live your life as if God never told you to submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Now, when I said this once at a Bible study, the ladies almost jumped on top of me and hit me. And I said, listen, don't stone the messenger. It's in the word of God. Okay, so you have a problem. Take it up with God, not with me. For children, it's almost as if God never said, obey your parents. We live our lives as if God never gave us commandments on how to treat the people we work with, how to treat our neighbors, how to treat the person who gets on your nerves. Living your life as if God never commanded us to do that. That is what lawlessness is talking about. Now, let, let me tell you something. Jesus is not suggesting, or neither am I suggesting, that you are saved by the works that you do. You are saved by faith. But as James said, faith without works is dead. If I were to tell you today, I'm going to give you a gift. By the way, I'm not, so please don't get excited about this. It's not going to happen. That I'm going to give you a gift that I have deposited a million dollars in a bank in Gaul. And once you finish this service, I want you to go next morning, if you believe me, go to Gaul in the morning, turn up at the bank, and they are going to give you, and, and tell them that I said, and they are going to give you the million dollars. And if I say, how many of you believe me? And say, all of you lifted up your hands and said, yes, we believe you. And then I said, then I need you to go and do this. And you say, Hallelujah. Praise God. And at the end of the service, you walk out the doors and just go about your life and none of you all turn up to Gaul. What does it mean? It means you never believed me in the first place. Faith without works is dead. Friends, do we truly believe that the word Bible is the word of God? Do we truly believe that the God of the Bible is a God who is all loving, who is all powerful, who is all wise. And in this Bible, he has told us how to live. And if we live this way, we will have life and blessing and abundance. Do we truly believe that? Because if we believe that, 
then we will be spending every day mining this word of God and saying, God, show me what I must do today. What do you have for me? I want everything that God wants of my life. So if you are a disciple of Jesus, what he's saying, don't just call me Lord. Do what I say. In the book of Luke, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? And finally, by the way, when a preacher says finally, there are a couple of finalists. This is my first one. A wise man who builds his house on the rock and a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And that's in Matthew 7, 24 to 27. It says, therefore, and this is how you are a wise man. Therefore, and this is how you build on the rock. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. See, it is difficult, but it is simple. It's not complicated. Following Jesus is not complicated. It is extremely simple. It's difficult, but simple. And by the way, Jesus never asks us to do things that you and I cannot do. He does the things we cannot do. You and I are called to do the easy things, which is difficult to us because our flesh screams out saying no. So this is what Jesus is saying. If you want to build your house on a rock, that the storms of this world cannot shake. If you want to build a faith that is not shaken by what's happening around you and, and the problems that happen, and this is what I see sometimes, you have people come to church and they're full of enthusiasm and something happens in their life and no more God. I don't want God anymore. They walk away from God. How do you build a solid faith? How do you build a solid life? Very simple, come to Jesus, hear what he says, and go and do it. Friends, let me tell you something. I don't know whether you're, um, but I'll be invited here after I say this, but let me tell you this. Coming to church has no value if you don't make a choice to practice what is preached and you hear from this place. Reading your Bible has no value. I mean, some people do it like a ritual. Every morning I must read my Bible. But if you don't listen to what the Word of God is saying and put it applied in your life, there is no value to that. Going for Bible study has no value if you are not ready and committed to applying what is taught in that place. And that is why James writes in James 1, 22 to 25, but be doers of the Word, and not hearers only, listen to this, deceiving yourself. What James is saying is, listen, if you come to church, you hear the message, you hear the sermon, and you've heard a whole series of this, and you end up saying, okay, now go back, thank you very much, you know, go to the preacher, sometimes I do this, we go to the preacher and says, awesome message, I hope you will say that at the end of this, but. <laughs> and we say those things. And honestly, after many years of doing this, I am tired of hearing that. Not that my message is awesome, but people coming to you and saying, good message. What I want to hear is, listen, I want to put this into my life. What must I do to apply this in my life? I'm not going to take this and go to heaven with me. What are we going to do? Are we going to apply this? If we come and hear this and go away without doing it, the Bible, James says, we are deceived. And let me tell you, there are a lot of people sitting in church that are deceived. They feel that, you know what, I have gone to church on Sunday. I go every Sunday. This month, I didn't miss a single service. I've heard people say, you know, I read the Bible every day in the morning. But when you look at their lives, they're not obeying Jesus. 
They are not following what the Bible says. They are not following scripture. And then the question comes, are they deceived? And I believe that's what Jesus is saying. So in closing, this is my second finally. Jesus outlines two parts for us. The first is you enter through a narrow gate. Which leads to a narrow or difficult path. And in that narrow and difficult path, you and I are called to profess Jesus as Lord. But to not just profess with our mouths, but to make him the Lord of your lives. How do you do that? By hearing what he says and doing it. And when we do that, our lives would be fruitful and we become more and more like Jesus. And we will be blessed, we will be known by him, and we will have life. Now, I said we will be known by him. Someone said it this way. What is important is not who you know, but who knows you. See, if I go to the president's house, and says, you know, I know who the president is, I've, I've seen him, I have read about him, I know him, I know he's our president, and I go and knock on the door, on the gate, and say, I know the president, let me in, guess what? I'm going to probably be shot or kicked out. What matters is not who I know, but if he knows me, then I will get passage to go inside. You will be known by him, and you will have life. That's one pathway. The second pathway is very is the other one. The wide gate, it should be wide gate. The broad path, where you profess Jesus as Lord with your mouth, but in reality, he is not your Lord. Because Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? You're hearing the word, but you're not practicing it. Therefore, you have a fruitless and a carnal life. And where does that end? In deception, where you think you're a wonderful Christian, a disciple of Jesus, when you're not. You, he does not know you. And he said that Lord, road leads to destruction. I believe as a church, you're talking about discipleship. That's the first pathway. That's what discipleship is all about. It is entering the gate. It is walking the difficult path. It is making Jesus the Lord of your life. It is obeying what he says. Remember what Jesus said, go and make disciples. By doing what? Baptizing them, you know, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. You and I have to make a choice which path we are going to take. And as I said before, you don't have a choice to say, I'm not choosing any one of those paths. Because consciously or unconsciously, intentionally or unintentionally, you and I are already on one of those pathways. The question is, which one are you on? And that's why at the end of this sermon, Jesus doesn't leave it to chance. He doesn't just give an open invitation and says, okay, guys, go think about it. If you feel convicted, come back tomorrow. At the end of the sermon, he says, enter by the narrow gate. That is a command. That is an imperative. He's saying you need to choose that gate because that's the only path to life. Amen. Let us pray. As we pray, I would like to give you a few moments. What is God speaking to you? It doesn't have to be today. It may have been in the past so many weeks since this series was started. Matthew chapter 5. 
It may have been any one of those. What is God telling you through his word? Think about it. Ask yourself, have I put it into practice? Ask yourself, what am I not doing that God has told me to do? And some of us here know exactly what that is. Make a conscious choice, make an intentional decision. God, I want to walk through that narrow gate and I want to walk that difficult path because that's the only way to life. Father, today I bring my precious brothers and sisters here, Lord, before your throne of grace. And Lord, you know it would have been easy not to preach this sermon. But yet, Lord, this is what you have given. And in obedience to your word, Lord, I did what you asked me to do. Now, Lord, I pray that you will speak to your servants, to your children. You will stir within their hearts, O oh God, to be people who are wise, who build on the rock, who come to you, hear what you say, and put it into practice. Stir in their hearts, Lord, to be people not who just profess you to be, Lord, but who obey your word. Lord, help them in this church to be fruit-bearing Christians and disciples of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.